from the Berwick Public Library. We're so happy to be reopened and have all of our patrons be able to come back for a great programming like tonight. This is our first program since last March. We are so happy to welcome Caroline Elanthus as an author who is here to talk about her new book, Ecological Memory. So everyone, this is Caroline Elanthus, and she's here tonight all the way from Maryland, which is a long journey for you guys. Well, we came up this morning from um, Acadia in Maine. Oh, you did come yeah. up from Acadia. So you two volunteer up there. Isn't that, that's a whole other topic we could talk about, huh? Um, Caroline is a science writer. Her, she usually writes science um, and fiction. Blend, oh, her fiction blends science and story. She's also an author of Climate in Emergency, and that's a blog. And I assume under your name, if people wanted to search for that, they could look. Oh, yeah. I'm the only Caroline Elanthus in the world, so that makes me really easy to Google. It's, it's not like Kelly. <laughs> so, um, Ecological Memory yes. me, is her second book. Her first book is To Give a Rose. So we will have a copy of each in the library after, and you're more than encouraged to take it out and learn. Um, she grew up in Delaware, attended various small, odd schools, mostly in New England, earning a BA in Environmental Leadership and an MS in Environmental Studies. And she lives in Maryland with her husband and assorted animals, which yes. is another topic we could um, <laughs> talk about for a long time. So thank you for coming. I'm sorry you had a hairy time getting here, but welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and thank you for having me. Um, we are here to discuss my novel and also some of the ideas that grow out of it. See, a couple of years ago, I wrote this book about loss and resilience in the face of uh, a terrible global pandemic. And then, wouldn't you know it, we had an actual terrible global pandemic. That's not what I wanted to have happen, but um, it has presented me with the opportunity to see how my fiction compares with real life. So I want to share some of those discoveries with you, and I'll introduce the book and its major characters first, and then we'll dive right into that. There'll be plenty of time for questions and so forth afterwards. Um, Elsie Rodriguez still can't remember how or where she survived the fall of civilization. It's been 20 years. All she needs now, all she has now, is a few memories of the trees she played among as a child. Fortunately, Elsie is apprenticed to the brilliant and mysterious itinerant ecologist Andy Cote. If anyone can figure out where the forests of her memory grew, he can. But Andy, too, is lost. When the old civilization fell, his son vanished. Now he ha has questions he ha can neither answer nor let go. In helping Elsie reclaim her home, can Andy too find peace? Part scientific detective story, part po post-apocalyptic travel log, ecological memory is at heart a tale about what happens after you lose everything. I will read the first few paragraphs kind of introduce you to the book and pages stick together and shouldn't. Come on, there you go. What's it like having hair grow out of your face? Elsie asked as she watched her ecology professor shave in the shade of a hemlock grove. He paused and looked at her. You have hair growing out of your face. He said, you should know what it's like. Elsie's cheeks grew hot and she looked away. She was sensitive about her few chin hairs, but Andy didn't insult and he rarely teased. He probably just meant her eyebrows. She turned back and watched him shave again. He let her watch, ignoring her gaze, as distant and professional as if they sat in his classroom back on campus. She felt safe with him. She didn't know why. She never played the little kid except with him, but she couldn't tell if he liked or merely tolerated the act. Without his white stubble, he looked younger, but Elsie could not guess his age. 
Personally, he remained a mysterious blank. Professionally, she knew he was impressive. Dr. Andrew Cote was one of the few scientists left from before the pandemic, and unlike a lot of survivors, he hadn't left his old career behind. Instead, he and a very few colleagues had fought to save data and scientific literature from failing computers, and then spent years reweaving professional networks and academic systems. 20 years later, he was still at it, crisscrossing the country on foot every summer. She planned to be an environmental educator, not a researcher, but she'd asked him to sponsor her application to the professional guilds anyway. Nobody knew more than he did about how science functioned as a human community, and nobody was better than him at explaining how to work with people. That, and she admired his simple, fearless doggedness. Everything else was a matter of rumor. People said he'd lost a wife and children in the pandemic, but of course a lot of people had. It was his refusal to discuss his family that lifted common tragedy to mythic status. Opinion split over whether he had remarried. Elsie had noticed, traveling with him, that he recorded video messages to someone every night on his little tablet computer. She did, he didn't know she knew. She had overheard him once, just the tone of his voice, soft and gentle, and she had resolved to never overhear again. She'd defend him from anyone, if necessary, even from her own curiosity. She never asked him if the rumors were true. Andy had knelt beside her and asked her to put out her hands. Oh, sorry, missed a sentence. She did once ask him to explain what 10% survival rate really meant in human terms. Andy had knelt beside her and asked her to put out her hands. She had laid them, all ten fingers, on the cool brown needles of the forest floor. The man drew his pocket knife and brought it down, hard, on her left pinky. Of course he didn't cut her, but it took all her will not to flinch. He repeated the motion with each of her other fingers, and each time she felt a thrill of fear and the impression of the knife blade lingering on her skin. When he had mimed cutting off all her fingers but one, he folded away his knife and caught up that one surviving finger, her right pinky, in his own warm hand and gave it a friendly little shake. Now live the rest of your life like this, he'd said. Obviously their pandemic is worse than ours. Theirs destroys civilization, something ours has never seriously threatened. And there are some other differences. One is that within this book, the word pandemic doesn't just refer to how the d disease spreads. It's also the name of the disease, as in, I had the pandemic, except I didn't. Uh, major historical events tend to leave their mark on a language, and the shift in meaning for this word is understandable given my character's situation. The best way for me to explain the way their pandemic works is to let Andy explain it. Uh, so I'm going to read another section. I should say that the reason Andy and Elsie are sharing a room here, uh, you know, nothing's going on, but that was the only room left at the inn where they're staying. The excerpt is fairly long, but I'm reading all of it because it includes some character development and world building stuff too. Uh, it will give you more of an idea of what the book's actually like. Come on, pages don't stick together. There you go. Good book. <laughs> this left Elsie and Andy nothing to do but retreat to their single room. Elsie wasn't especially attracted to Andy. She assumed he reciprocated her non-interest, but she couldn't ask him. He was her teacher, and he was most likely married, and he was some unknown but large number of years too old for her anyway. The subject was closed. The sense of the forbidden, plus not actually knowing for sure, gave the whole situation an ambiguity that could have been sexy and exciting with the right person, but with Andy it was just awful. In the dark, she could hear him shifting around in bed. He seemed uncomfortable with the arrangement, too. She wanted to do something to reassure him, to dial back the ambiguity at least a little bit. Tell me a story, she said in her little girl's voice. I don't know any stories, he confessed. I used to have to read to my daughter instead. I couldn't make anything up. That's okay. I don't know any stories but my own. That's the one I want to hear. It's not a great bedtime story. Tell it to me anyway. And this time, to her surprise, he did. 
Andy had indeed been uncomfortable. He knew there were men in his position who took advantage, and he didn't like to think that Elsie might fear him. But he felt no ambiguity, no attraction. She was just too young. If Sarah was still alive, she'd be about the same age. He'd been thinking of Sarah, not his living daughter, when he'd spoken of reading just now. He did not ask himself why. And so, when the girl asked, he gave in without thought, without caution, and gave her a bedtime story. The first thing that came to mind was the scent of the desert. The Sonoran Desert doesn't smell like anything else. It doesn't smell like a beach, although the soil is often sandy. Nor is the scent exactly explained by its mix of plants, although they do contribute. If it rains anywhere within miles, you can smell the creosote bushes come alive. A scent like an eastern hemlock grove, only more so, flows along most watercourses, the perfume of invasive tamarisk trees. The cloying aroma of desert willow could distract a hiker in April. But underneath all of that is something else, something delicate. Andy thought it might be the local mix of soil bacteria, but whatever it was, 20 years later, when he cast his memory back, that scent was the first thing to greet him. When the pandemic came, he began, I was out west, alone in the desert, working. I got the news online. How could you get online in the middle of the desert? There were cell phone towers any, everywhere. There were a lot of people back then, so there were a lot of cell phone towers. We had almost universal coverage there at the end. Wow. Okay, go on. So, on the news, there was just something about some measles cases in New York. Measles was rare, but not unheard of. No big deal. The strange thing was, after a few days, they said those people had already been vaccinated. The vaccine hadn't protected them. So the pandemic was measles? Nobody told me that. When Elsie spoke, he saw their small, darkened room around him. When he replied, he was back in the desert. The shift was jarring. He let himself slip back into his story again. No, see, the thing is, measles isn't like the flu, where you need a new vaccination for every strain. With measles, the part of the virus that triggers the immune response doesn't mutate. If you're resistant to one strain, you're resistant to all of them, or it isn't measles. This wasn't measles. The symptoms were similar, but not identical. The biggest difference was with the pandemic, pneumonia wasn't just a rare complication, it was an inherent part of the disease. That's why so many people died. They came up with a name for the thing, some acronym, but it never caught on. We called it the pandemic, same as now. Anyway, a few days after that, they said the same thing, a measles-like pneumonia was spreading in other cities around the world, London, Melbourne, Sao Paulo, there were a lot of places. But it wasn't that the other cities had all caught it from New York. It's that as far as anybody could tell, they'd actually all gotten the disease at the same time. It just took a week or so for everybody to realize the news stories in different countries matched. Wait, multiple cities all at once? Was this thing on purpose? Yes, probably, but nobody ever proved it. Nobody even settled on a really good motive. The people who did it are probably all dead by now. That's horrible. Well, yes, it's a horrible story. Do you want me to tell it? Yes, please. Sorry. The thing is, only a few dozen people were even sick yet. We'd had pandemic scares before, but they never really amounted to anything. As weird as this one was, I figured the public health people would just take care of it. Civilization seemed really remote to me that winter, and I had a lot to do. I had to map out potential bat roosts and nectar sources so I'd know where to put my interns during the spring migration. But I didn't know they were underestimating the scope of the disease. The public health service, I mean. A lot of people were misdiagnosed or just never sought help. And for the first week or so, there were no obvious symptoms. You just felt tired, maybe ran a light fever, nothing you'd go to the doctor about, but you were already contagious. So however many people the CDC knew were sick, there were always many more. And those extra people each infected an average of 10 more. So when the authorities tried to contain the disease, it was already outside the container. We never had a chance. But we didn't know, so I just kept doing my job. When I went into town for another month or so of groceries, I noticed people were freaking out, but that always happened with pandemic warnings, so I ignored it and went back out. But then my wife called me. She said the mystery disease, the pandemic, she said it was in Boston. It was in a lot of cities by then. Chicago, L.A., Dallas, anywhere with a major airport. But we lived in Keene, right near Boston. 
and there were little satellite infections springing up in smaller cities and towns all over. Everywhere they screened, they found the pandemic already there. But she didn't call to tell me that. She had assumed I already knew. She called to tell me not to worry about her, that she and the kids were fine, that I should stay out in the desert like a reverse quarantine for as long as I could so I wouldn't get infected. She'd heard the disease was in Tucson, right near me. She wanted me to stay safe. What did you say? I said, F that. What did you think I'd say? I wasn't going to let my family get this thing without me. So I packed up my stuff and drove to Phoenix. I was going to catch a plane, get back east. So I got to Phoenix and there were no planes. They just imposed a travel ban that day, a few hours before I got there. The airport was full of people, there were still planes landing, but nobody was allowed to take off and everybody was shouting and waving money around. It was insane. I, uh, I remember sitting in the airport, trying to figure out what to do, watching the TV there, all about the emergency measures, and then my cell phone rings and, I'm sorry, this is just, I, I know, your wife, I'm sorry, and my daughter. I'm really sorry. Thanks, Andy said. He remembered for a moment, not sadness, which he'd had no time for back then, but simply how surreal everything was. How the president on TV calmly discussing the imminent end of civilization with the pandemic rash already on his face had seemed no more remarkable than the giant airplanes coming into land outside. Neither had looked quite real. His wife must have lied to him, he'd thought. She must have lied. He'd repeated the same thought over and over, unable to focus well enough to finish with the one idea and go on to the next. They just said, on the news, they just said, two to four days survival from onset of definitive symptoms. But he talked with her that morning, and she'd said she was fine. She and the kids were fine. She must have been lying. She tried to save his life, the last thing she did, and she'd failed because here he was in the middle of tens of thousands of probably contagious people all for nothing but he would not cry with Elsie. I couldn't help my wife and daughter, but my son was still out there. I didn't know where he was. The man who contacted me said my son was at our neighbor's house, but when I called, the phone just went to voicemail. Same thing with most of our other friends in the area. Most of them were probably sick already. The few I could get a hold of had left town, so nobody could help me look for my boy. I tried the police, but they didn't seem to think a missing eight-year-old was an emergency. They thought I just couldn't find my babysitter's phone number or something. I couldn't explain it right. They were polite to me. I could have killed someone. I had to get back east and look for him myself. But I couldn't get a permit to get through the roadblocks. I started looking for ways to smuggle myself through, but somebody stole my supplies out of the back of my truck, and I couldn't replace it all at once. They were rationing food and gas so people wouldn't drive across country. I hoarded what I could a little at a time. Days went by. Everything was just ridiculously difficult. Things in Phoenix were falling apart. It wasn't that everybody was dying. Only a few dozen people in the city were even sick yet. No, the problem was fear. People mobbed stores, buying up face masks, vitamin C, and duct tape as if that would help. And alcohol doesn't kill viruses, only bacteria. There were public dispensers for it all over the place anyway. People just weren't thinking. Anytime someone would show up on the street with what looked like the rash, even if it was just a sunburn, everybody would panic. And some looked for someone to blame. You said you thought the pandemic might have been deliberately created. So did we, but we didn't know who. So some people guessed. It was a government conspiracy. It was the Chinese. It was the Arabs. It was white people. It was Mexicans. Mexicans? Oh, sure. There was a lot of tension because of the perceived competition for jobs between Anglos and Latinos, especially in the Southwest. And there are always people in the country, in this country who didn't like immigrants. Yeah, my mother told me that. Her parents brought her here when she was little, without papers. Go on. The most ridiculous idea I heard was that Muslim terrorists from Syria or Iran had invented the virus and were smuggling it into the United States inside undocumented Mexican immigrants. Guys went out into the desert with guns. You know, it's funny. When I was your age, we were all obsessed with zombies. I don't know why. There were movies and books and stupid little games on the internet all about the zombie apocalypse. And then it actually happened. We were all the walking dead running around in desperate need of brains. But I still thought I was going to get out. I was going to be an exception. I was going to find some way through and go find my boy. Then I started coughing. I looked in the mirror and the rash looked back at me. 
On some level, I knew the pandemic wasn't a death sentence. Lots of people recovered. The real mortality was from what happened later. But I wasn't thinking survival statistics. I was thinking, that's it. I failed. I'm dead. I wasn't going to make it to New Hampshire. Even with a car, the trip al took almost a week. The hospitals were overloaded by then, and they couldn't do much for you anyway. So I got in my truck, and I headed north to the Grand Canyon to wait. I figured if I was going to die, I might as well do it somewhere pretty, away from the crowds. But then my stupid truck broke down on the way. I was starting to feel really bad at that point, really sick, and I thought, well, this is great. Here I am about to die on the shoulder of the damned interstate. So I rigged up my tarp for shelter and privacy and crawled into the back of my truck, got in my sleeping bag, and waited. Everything hurt. I couldn't breathe well, but the worst thing, I was bored. I couldn't sleep or even daydream because of the pain and because I was out of my head with fever. Time passed. I don't know how much. Then the fever broke. Breathing got a little easier. I sat up and it was like the fog had cleared. The virus was gone. But my lungs still felt awful. My truck still wouldn't start and my sleeping bag was soiled, just soaked. So I figured I was going to die of exposure. I'd gotten up, gotten myself cleaned up and dressed when I was trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do. When, I'm not kidding, three guys I knew come riding up on horseback and Andy suddenly realized that Elsie hadn't asked a question in a while. He listened to her silence and concluded she was asleep. He tried not to feel slighted, but there was no way he was going to get back to sleep himself. He hadn't thought about these things in a long time. The way the desert smelled, the sounds of the riots in Phoenix, the cold, hard feeling of being sure he was about to die. And before all that, how it felt not to be a widower. He'd forgotten that one. He felt all jazzed up, ready for battle, but there was no one to fight, nothing to do in this silent house of sleeping friends. He got up and went to the bathroom and then walked down to the common room, sat in the dark at the empty bar, and turned on his tablet. He hadn't meant to share so much. He had planned to talk about his experience of the pandemic, not himself, but the two had proved in inseparable. He had not been able to stop the feelings from coming up. And when Elsie somehow knew or guessed that his wife had died, he had been unable to deny it. He had managed to keep some things back, like the story of what happened to his parents and brother. But those thoughts and images, too, were all stirred up in his mind anyway. Should he have shared any of his story? He told himself that Elsie had needed to hear it and would need to hear at least an edited version of the rest, that he was giving her what her parents wouldn't or couldn't. She had a right to know where her world came from. So what if these things were things he would rather not think of ever again? Her need trumped his. But he also scolded himself that he'd had no right to tell her, that she hadn't even wanted him to, that she'd just been going through her stupid little kid routine for whatever reason, and he'd burdened her with his tail out of a selfish need for catharsis. Mostly he thought about nothing in particular at all, just waited for exhaustion and the mindless rhythm of computer solitaire to calm him. By the time he returned to his room, the moon, waning towards half, had risen high enough to shine across the roofs of the buildings on the other side of the street and in at the window. Its light shone on Elsie, sleeping with her mouth open, and her dark braid splayed all over the pillow. She looked very young. The moonlight reminded him of street lights the once ubiquitous, ubiquitous sodium glow of another age, another house, another girl. He put out his hand to stroke the hair of the sleeping woman, but didn't complete the gesture. He put his hand away and went back to bed. Uh, I moved my notes by accident. Uh, I hadn't really set out to write about a pandemic. I set out to write about what happened after the end of civilization. The pandemic was just a mechanism I used to create the post-apocalyptic world I wanted to talk about. But if I'm going to write about something, I'm going to do it right. I wanted epidemiologists to read this book and not, you know, start twitching. Uh, so I read up on how infectious diseases spread and what health officials do about it. and. I thoroughly picked the brain of a very generous virology student a friend of mine introduced to me. I created an imaginary disease and it sweeped through humanity and I made educated guesses about how humanity would respond. 
When life began to imitate art, it was eerie. Friends who had already read the book contacted me, a bit freaked out. It had seemed at times as though I'd predicted the future. I hadn't. I'd simply listened to experts who said that we were vulnerable to a pandemic and that a disease likely to become a pandemic would have certain characteristics. For example, we've seen how when there's an Ebola outbreak or a dangerous new flu strain, anything like that, health officials all over the world are pretty quick to jump on it. When a new disease pops up in a rural area, they can usually contain it pretty effectively. So even though most new diseases do pop up in rural areas, a pandemic is more likely to start in a city because that makes it harder to contain. Similarly, you might think that the worst case scenario is something like Ebola because it has a high mortality rate and horrific symptoms. But actually, Ebola is pretty easy to keep track of. You know, everybody who has it is dying. You, you don't l overlook that. Uh, far worse would be a highly contagious disease that sometimes has mild symptoms or none at all that can spread under the radar and it would be impossible to contain. And even a relatively low mortality rate can be catastrophic when everyone gets sick. So I wrote about a respiratory disease that first appears in cities and becomes contagious before symptoms start. COVID-19 has the same profile, but of course it does. It has to, or this would not have happened. The fictional disease does have a higher mortality rate than COVID, but what makes it end civilization is that it's more contagious. Having spent a couple of years imagining catastrophe, I might have let myself get really freaked out by the real pandemic, except I knew what a disease had to be and do in order to pose an existential threat. And COVID, bad as it is, um, is not as easily transmissible as it could have been. There are advantages to being a stickler for realism, and one of them is you stay a bit more grounded when life imitates art. Creating a plausible fictional pandemic was one thing. Figuring out how society would respond was something else. Uh, and there, the experts couldn't help me. After all, very few living people had ever seen anything even remotely comparable. Now think about that. Only two years ago, we didn't know. I guess correctly about the xenophobia and the blaming. I guess correctly that there would be panic buying. I guess correctly that there would be economic disruption, uh, much worse in the case of the fictional pandemic. Um, I guess correctly that there would be panic buying, although I thought it would be duct tape, not toilet paper that flew off the shelves. There are other things I got right too, but I overestimated the tendency to riot I missed the way many people would pull together. I completely missed social distancing. And although the fictional disease, like the real one, is much worse for anybody with pre-existing conditions or difficulty accessing medical care for whatever reason, I didn't realize how that would translate into racial disparities. Uh, I should have gotten that one. I really should have. I was and probably still am naive. I started writing with a couple of goals in mind, but the story evolved as I wrote it. Uh, one of my goals was to explore the science the way actual scientists experience it, as part of everyday life, a shared frame of reference. But I knew most of my readers wouldn't be scientists. So how do I explain something as normal to people it isn't normal to? Uh, part of the solution that I developed was to have Andy and Elsie use their shared frame of reference, science, uh, ecology specifically, to talk about a subject familiar to everybody, human interaction. Uh, here is an example. Pages do not stick together, come on, open up, there you go. Okay. If this were a movie, she said in a dreamy voice, you'd turn out to be my real father. She was lying on her belly, chin in hand, kicking her feet idly. 
She was being 10 again. Andy looked up from his book for a moment. I think I'd know, he said dryly. Elsie was about to point out that being a man, he might not. A man could father a child and not know. When she realized what such a comment would imply about his character, she shut her mouth. I'd also know, he added, as though he could read her mind, if there was a possibility I might not know. Elsie's face reddened and she looked away. She would not apologize for thinking, however embarrassing the thought. Anyway, she hadn't meant that Andy was her dad, only that in a movie he would be because movies are like that. He wasn't even her father figure, not exactly. She didn't know what Andy was to her or what she was to him. She didn't know for sure if she was important to him at all. The silence stretched out for a while. I have some articles on insect host plant choices, Andy said finally. If you want me to send them to you too? Sure. Somehow she had started to specialize in insects and how they interacted with human communities. She was researching now for a series of more in-depth workshops on the subject. You know, Andy began conversationally, there is, or at least used to be, a community of urban butterflies in the Northwest that aren't using any of the remaining pl native plants there. They are completely dependent on exotics in people's gardens. That's what's called a novel ecosystem, species that didn't evolve together but form a functional community anyway. If you got everybody to grub up those exotics and replant with natives, what would happen to those butterflies? Elsie happened to be facing away from him as he spoke, so she allowed herself to roll her eyes fondly. In her workshops, she often stated authoritatively that non-native plants are inedible to native insects and so starve insect-eating birds. That living things need their evolutionary partners, the species they grew up with, so to speak, to survive. So naturally, Andy had found a counterexample. He liked to do that. Questions interested him far more than certainty. She made an interested noise. Relationships between organisms that do not share evolutionary history might not be as nuanced or as specialized, he continued, addressing the back of her head, but sometimes they are enough. Elsie turned to face him, surprised, but his expression was unreadable. Something inside her had softened at his words, but she wasn't sure it should have. Everything he said could be understood on more than one level, and she never knew which he actually meant and couldn't imagine asking. Uh, out of conversations like that, uh, you know, using these metaphors to talk about themselves and each other, evolved what became one of the central themes of the story. Now, no one scene encapsulates that theme any more than one scene encapsulates the entire plot, but uh, this next passage uh, should show you what I mean. Here, Andy and Elsie are having lunch aboard a ferry boat. In Maine, incidentally. Um, it is good, Andy pronounced. Does it actually taste like fried oysters? Sort of, Elsie replied. A little. You've never had oysters? No. He obviously thought the answer was self-evident. Have you ever broken Jewish dietary laws? I break some of them often, but the laws I do follow, I haven't broken those since I rode east the first time. Why not? Why follow some laws and not others? I don't know. You're like my mother, Elsie commented and took a bite out of her roll. Excuse me? You're religious the same way. She says I was christened, and she crosses herself sometimes, but she didn't object when I didn't want to be confirmed. She only goes to Mass on Christmas and Easter. I don't think she prays anymore, so she's like you. She's religious out of habit. Andy leaned back and folded his arms across his chest. In my case, it's a little more than that, he said, after a pause. I'm Jewish because my mother was Jewish. She was because of her parents. One of my parents had the... One of my grandfathers, had the numbers, you know, on his arm. If I assimilate, if I start thinking and acting like everybody else, then for what did they survive? Why did they come here to America if not for me to be able to live as a Jew here? And he went back to eating his roll. The boat started moving again with a small jolt. Elsie exhaled, blowing the hair out of her face. 
She was used to the shadow of the pandemic, but this? She'd read about the Holocaust in books. She'd never thought to find its legacy sitting across a table from her, sharing a basket of fries. Your family has been through two tragedies then, she said. I hadn't thought about that. Everybody goes through something. It's like hurricanes, she said after some thought. Oh, yeah. The Great September Gale, the Hurricane of 1938, Tropical Storm Irene, Hurricane Odette. You told me how to find sign from all of them. But those scars don't mar the landscape, do they? They create it. What you're talking about is disturbance history, Andy told her. Say, fire. People look at a wildfire, they think it's the end of the world. As he spoke, he noticed he had a blob of ketchup on his left hand. It looked almost like blood. He put his roll down and used his ketchup hand as a sort of a palette, daubing violently red spot in the middle of the table with his right index finger. And it is the end of the world, he continued, if your world happens to be encompassed by the particular patch that burned. Animals and plants die in fires. Sometimes people do. That loss is very real. But it is local in both place and time. If you pull back, if you look at the bigger scale, you'll see there's lots of little burn patches in various stages of recovery. He began dotting the table with lots of little ketchup blobs. Pull back far enough and you see the fires are just part of a larger complex pattern, like the log patches in the mountains, if you remember. He, served, he surveyed his work and Elsie laughed to see it. He'd made a rather crooked and pointless smiley face. <coughs> Notice his line, and it is the end of the world if your world is the patch that burned. The loss is very real. The larger pattern he describes doesn't make the tragedy not tragic. He knows better than that. He lost family to members to the pandemic, and his grandfather lost family to the Holocaust. There is no planet where things like that are not just awful, but he's an ecologist. And the idea of apparent contradiction between scales is very important in some forms of ecology. What he's, what's going on at a small scale can appear to be the exact opposite of what's going on at a large scale. And yet both are real and both interact with each other. So we're not using an analogy here. It's not like, let's pretend human beings are ecosystems. Rather, the discipline of ecology provides a certain perspective on how systems work. Ecosystems are systems, but so are human societies and even human minds. So studying ecology gives you a way of thinking about all of these things be beyond ecology. And maybe that kind of perspective helps Andy to cope. It can help other people too. I'm not saying everybody needs to go study ecology. I'm not saying insights gained from science are the best lost my place. I'm not saying that insights gained through science are necessarily the best way to cope with the slings and arrows of fate. I'm saying that Andy's source of perspective and comfort is another example of something that I covered in fiction that ends up working in real life. I know that because right after I published Ecological Memory, my sister died. She didn't die of COVID, she had cancer, but that doesn't matter a whole lot. The point is that I know that there is no planet on which her death, or the death of any loved one, is anything other than awful. Knowing that there is a larger world, a larger pattern, doesn't take that away. But being able to regard both scales as equally real and equally valid does help the scale that hurts be a little bit easier to deal with. But I don't want you to think that my book is nothing but science, tragedy, and beautifully described landscapes. Before we close, I want to read you one more excerpt. By the way, they just came down from hiking Mount Monadnock, if any of you have done that. In the morning after breakfast, she and Andy headed back towards Homestead across wet ground under a sky as gray as glue. The air still felt damp. A fitful breeze spat cold at them now and then. Is it just that we're so much further north than I'm used to, or is this cold for April? 
asked Elsie. It's within the realm of normal, I'd say, replied Andy, looking at the sky. You know, I remember snow on the ground in April around here, a couple of inches. Did you have to walk both ways uphill to school, too? She teased him. She knew perfectly well that he was right. The climate had been colder, but older people always said that sort of thing, and true or not, it had become a cliché. He laughed. He had a wonderfully boyish laugh, like a grin that had boiled over, showing a row of tiny, well-spaced teeth. Did you know there's a stretch of the Appalachian Trail that actually is uphill both ways, he asked. Yeah. Yeah, well, on average, anyway, the trail does go up and down a lot. He traced zigzag mountains in the air with his finger. How do you figure? Okay, so the highest point on the Appalachian Trail is on top of Clingman's Dome in Tennessee, right? Okay, agreed Elsie. She didn't actually know the relative elevations of the various ele Appalachian peaks, but she had no reason to doubt Andy. So, since Clingman's Dome is higher than the northern terminus at Mount Katahdin in Maine, a northbound hiker averages downhill from Clingman's Dome on. Okay. Well, the lowest point on the trail is at the Hudson River crossing. That was the lowest point on the whole trail? They had followed that section of the AT on their way north from Pennsylvania. Yeah, it all averages uphill from there. But since the Hudson Crossing is north of Clingman's Dome, that section is already averaging downhill for a northbound hiker. So the section of trail from the Hudson River to Mount Katahdin is both uphill and downhill if you're heading north and is therefore uphill both ways. Brilliant. Is thinking of things like that what geniuses normally do in their spare time? Well, we could try to take over the world, but that usually takes money. Um, I will have a pile of books out there if um, you all want signed copies. That would be excellent. But first, let's talk. Does anybody have any questions, comments, answers? Yes? Kind of, uh, what are they using for energy? I mean, they, they seem to have uh, transport and, uh, and ketchup. So uh, it doesn't sound like they're really that bad off. Now they've got internet. So, I mean, those are the last things. I, I'm catch up in the internet when I would have thought they'd been the first thing that would have went. That's a good point. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And um, a lot of thought went into that part. Um, when, the, when civilization crashed, catch up and the internet were both gone. Uh, this is 20 years later. Uh, over the 20 years, they started rebuilding, and uh, they have, um, you know, they're not living in sort of like a Mad Max zone. You know, they're, they're, it's a new civilization, it's a different civilization, but they're they are putting something back together. As to what they're using for fuel, uh, fossil fuel use is over. Uh, technology has not been forgotten. Um, so they're using a mix of solar power, wind power, hy hydropower, and um, biofuels. Now, an important thing about that is that the absolute amount of energy that they have available is much less than what's possible with fossil fuels. Uh, and this is something that isn't really part of the conversation on climate change and um, sustainability and really should be. And that is that you know, without going, I mean, there's a rabbit hole we could dive down here into um, complex systems science and um, we probably should not do that right now. But one way of looking at the environmental crisis that we have right now is, uh, and I, I, there's a uh, appendix at the back of the book that goes into this in more detail and there's actually citations and things like that. Um, one way to look at this though is that the biosphere and the climate which you know, is part of uh, is a complex system that is has been pushed into um, 
the entropic stage, when a system like, like this, like a person, is pushed into the entropic stage, it's called being deathly ill. You don't necessarily die, you can recover, but that's what's going on. And so think about what happens. Your temperature becomes unstable. Your body isn't working right. You might lose a fantastic amount of weight, uh, fantastic not in a good way. Uh, you can't do the things you normally do. And that's what we see happen. You know, the temperature is not stable. Uh, the biosphere is shrinking. Um, things are not working properly. The planet is literally sick. It's an, an analogous process. And the reason why that's happened is that we've been using, we've been drawing so much energy out of the system. We've been drawing that by using fossil fuels. However, if we found an, a different way to draw as much energy out of the system, the same thing would happen. It would happen in a different way. The details would be different. But the problem would be just as severe. Uh, you know, if there's a cancer patient and you somehow cure them of cancer by giving them a three mile long tapeworm, they're just as going to be dead. You know, that's not a solution. So what needs to happen is we need to use less energy, how, wherever it's coming from. And getting rid of fossil fuels is, makes using less energy much simpler. Uh, so they've done that. Um, but through the book, you see this weird mix of technologies with uh, a, these people are walking everywhere. You know, they want to get from Pennsylvania to New Hampshire. They walked. Uh, <laughs> you know, they transport things by ox carts. Um, the, the Internet is very small because it isn't a lot of, it, of energy for server, server power. But there is an, inter an internet, and there's a character who uses a robotic exoskeleton because she's a paraplegic. And uh, so there's this mix of technologies because they're working on much less energy, uh, as well as not having fossil fuel. So long answer to an excellent, excellent question. Would you say they're, where, where are they, 19th century, 18th century, early 20th in energy use? In energy use, um, 18th, pre-industrial revolution, Thanks. possibly earlier than that. But they're not 18th century in terms of technological development, in terms of scientific understanding, in terms of social development. Uh, you know, we don't just, we don't just forget, you know, like, feminism and everything because we're not using fossil fuels any, a, anymore. Uh, feminism being something that's developed, you know, since then. You know, people will say like, oh, those environmentalists are trying to send us back to the Stone Age. No, it doesn't work like that. We only go forward. <laughs> it's just a different forward. It's a strange forward. It's a forward that's limited in some ways and much less limited in others. You know, they have, the people in this book get things that we're not sure we're going to get. You know, because they've gotten off of fossil fuels and they've limited their energy, their energy use. Any more? No, 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 I just, I'll discuss it later. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. A, a comment. I mean, everything has foundational pieces, right? I mean, everything is built on the shoulders up. Mm -hmm. And at what point in time, if those foundational pieces are not there, the whole thing comes down. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the question is, what are the foundational pieces that we need? And what are the ones that you know, we could construct or not. I mean, the internet being one of them. We could be right here without the internet, I think. Because mm -hmm. we were at one time. Mm -hmm. It's just expedited things. Well, what do you mean by what we need? To survive. Um, the number of people currently live on this planet 
probably requires an unsustainable energy expenditure. Um, hopefully we can take care of that through gentle attrition and not actually have, you know, catastrophe. Um, if there are a lot of things that if they, d if they just vanished, like poof, it's gone. You know, 90% of the people alive today would probably die. Uh, at the moment, um, I'm guessing, you know, based on what I've read and what I've heard, that uh, the fossil fuel industry is one of those things. An example used in this book is that there is a place in um, California that's this, I believe it's in California, it's, this, it's the size of Rhode Island and it just grows almond trees. That's all that's there, almond trees. And it's so, you, you know, solidly almond trees that bees can't live there because except when the almond trees are in flower, there are no flowers. There's nothing for them to eat. So every year in February, 80% of the United States beehives get loaded on trucks and shipped out to California to pollinate the, al the almond trees. If, as happens in this book, right before that's supposed to happen, um, every long haul trucker in the country simultaneously comes down with uh, you know, this disease, Uh, and deli fuel deliveries stop, people paying attention to pipelines all call in sick, fuel doesn't move, nothing moves. Those almond trees don't set fruit. They don't set, which means they basically don't grow almonds. So what do you do if you're living in the middle of an area the size of Rhode Island of almond trees that are not growing almonds? What do you do? Well, you'd better, you'd better start walking because if you don't get out of there, you're gonna die. I remember hearing that there's like, I, two or three, I forget the number, but there's a small number of bridges into New England. And without those bridges, if those bridges just stopped, or if trucks stopped moving across those bridges, New England would run out of food in a month. What do you do when the trucks stop coming? At this moment in time, uh, fossil fuel use is a foundational piece. Now, fossil fuel use has only been happening for um, a little under 200 years. It didn't exist back then. So obviously we don't need it to be human. We don't need it to be smart. We don't need it to develop ourselves as people. We don't need it to be happy. We don't need it to love one another. We could build a society that doesn't use fossil fuel. But we have to build it. We have to make a new foundation. And um, what the foundational pieces are in the abstract, what humans couldn't live without under any circumstances, what we couldn't build anything without, I don't know. I mean, except for, you know, basics like food and water and each other. We need each other. Most humans do really badly without other humans. Uh, but hasn't the pandemic really pointed out that everything is comprised of systems? Yes. And when the systems start breaking down, there are certain critical systems that you need. Yes. There are certain things that we need to have done. There are certain services that we need. We have systems that provide those services, and at certain critical points, you're right, they break, and then we don't have those services. And we, we can end up in an existential problem then. Um, Different systems that give us those services are possible. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book was to kind of hint at what, the, what one of the things that that might look like could be. 
how those other systems might work. How many people are alive on this planet? You mean here? Yeah, what, what, what does it crash back to? 10% uh, total survival, and I'm bad at math, so I can't do that on my, but whatever, 10% um, of what are we, 7 billion? Well, it's 7 billion. Okay, see, one of the things about me being bad at math is I continually forget, the, you know, the upper ranges of the orders of magnitude, I forget, you know. Okay, yeah, so 700 million people then. And uh, yeah, they wouldn't be scattered, it wouldn't be even. Uh, mortality would be much higher in the cities because of the whole what do you do when the trucks stop coming issue. So it, it's going to be 700 million scattered over, mostly over rural areas that are near intact forests or oceans where you can hunt or fish until you can get your, your farm going. If you know how to farm. If you do. Or if you have a friend who does. You know, make friends with farmers. <laughs> Yes? Marilyn, it, it seems to me one of the things that is implicit in the book, although it's, I don't think you really hit over the head with it, is that much of the foundation that's rebuilt is rebuilt locally. So it's rebuilt based on the resources and the needs of a particular region or area as opposed, so, you know, it seems part of, part of what's important is you can have ketchup if you can grow tomatoes. Mm -hmm. If you can't grow tomatoes, then you don't have ketchup. Um, and it seems to me that that's an ongoing um, narrative. It, 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 in the book is the, the localization of, of the foundation. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, because transportation requires a lot of energy. And it's one of the things that can, and tr fast transportation requires a huge amount of energy. So that's one of the places it can be cut. It's one of the things we used to do without. So, yeah, uh, food and other goods become local and seasonal. And see, you have the advantage, you've read the book already, so you know this. Um, but, yeah, the, the, it, it is mentioned several times, like, uh, there's no coffee. Uh, people are drinking, um, in the morning, they drink a mix of uh, chicory and black tea. So the chicory makes it taste a little bit like coffee. You get the bitterness in the black tea, gives you caffeine. Black tea will grow in New England. And um, I've looked up online. Apparently, some people do, so it's there. And chicory is relatively easy to... Uh, but there's, there's no coffee. Um, there is uh, no chocolate. There are no bananas. Uh, <laughs> Yes, we have no bananas. Um, people don't have a lot of stuff. Uh, a computer, you know, it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot, you know, it, you know, all different kinds of metals. They reference Andy's computer several times. Um, you know, having a computer like that, a little tablet, it's designed to last forever. And it has to be because it costs, the, it costs as much as a car. You know, like having a, having a cell phone is like having a car. <laughs> you know, because it's just limited. And if you're going to do something that you can't do locally, that you can't build yourself, you can't grow yourself, you can't make yourself, if you have to order it from somewhere, it's going to cost a fortune. And it's going to come slowly. So what, do you want to live in a society like that? Yes. Um, I mean, for one thing, I can't have chocolate or, anyway, I'm allergic to it now. But, 
and, and it's possible. You can survive without chocolate. I used to be able to eat it, and I had to stop. And I, I tell, can tell you, we can adapt. It's all right. Because they have other things that we don't. Um, like? I'm coming up with a list. <laughs> um, writers aren't necessarily good at thinking quickly on their feet. Uh, this is why we hide away in our little holes and wear our computers in. Anyway, um, they're so, electric light is rare and it's never wasted. It's never used in vain. That means there's no light pollution. You go outside and you can see, if there's no clouds, you can see the Milky Way anywhere. If you live next to a pond, you can walk out of your house at night and there's a pond and there's a Milky Way and the calm pond water and you can see the Milky Way reflected in the water of the pond. Any night you like as long as there aren't clouds that day. The air smells better. There is, um, you know, no car exhaust. So no traffic. I mean, there's, you know, for traffic and ox carts and so forth on the major roads. But, um, you know, you can walk down any highway you like. Heat? What do they use for heat? Wood, mostly. And excellent insulation. You don't need a lot of heat if, you're, if you have a really well insulated house. I mean, you do need some unless you want to freeze. But, yeah. Um, I mean, and we heat with, with wood at home. Um, cooling, again, that, that simply becomes architectural. And we do that at home as well. Um, and you, it could do better. I mean, a, a building designed to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer with a minimum of, in, of inputs can really do very well. It's just that we don't design buildings that way these days. Um, There is something that is, we have, we're, we're experiencing now a collapse of insect populations. Which means, you ever notice that there aren't as many fireflies as there used to be? You know, I mean, when I was a kid, and I'm not that old, either there were bajillions of them in, you know, any suburban neighborhood. You go out and you run around and catch fireflies, there's billions of them now, it's like, firefly. Yeah. Um, the sound of insects. They've done studies, where, and, and birds, they've done studies where out of doors, the natural sounds are quieter than they were a generation ago. Because we're losing insects, and because we're losing insects, we're also losing birds. In this scenario, that reverses, and it reverses pretty quickly. I mean, we saw in our pandemic that once everybody stayed in their homes for a couple of weeks, the wildlife came out. I mean, there were like dolphins in Venice. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the sky turned blue in places where it had been smog gray for, you know, however long. I mean, that, that's going to happen, and it's going to stay, and you can just go out and, you know, the birds and the crickets and all of that will be, you know, louder than I've ever heard it. Um, louder than anybody younger than me has heard it. And I don't know all about you, but it's like for my whole life, I've lived with this anxiety, you know, of knowing about pollution, knowing about, you know, they're cutting down the rainforest, they're doing this, you know, we're running out of fish, this, all of this, this constant worry. You know, is it, I mean, is this planet going to die? They don't have that. The question's been answered. The answer is no. Came close, but it's coming back. And we're going to be okay. And our children will have a greener, more alive planet than we have. Our grandkids will it'll be even better for them. We're going to stop losing endangered species. We're going to 
forests are going to be growing again. I mean, you need forests to grow again to suck up all of this extra carbon dioxide and so forth. Um, you know, rainforests are going to be growing. I imagine how that would feel. I, I want that. I, I, am I willing to get, even if I, if I did not have my allergy and I could still eat chocolate, would I give up chocolate for that? You bet. In a heartbeat. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah, I mean, I worry about my nieces and nephew. What kind of world are they going to live in? Uh, so this is more utopian than dystopian. Yeah, this is a utopia. Uh, it's not a dystopia. It's a utopia that's difficult to get to. Um, but it, it's, and it's a... You had to slaughter 90% of the people on the planet <laughs> to get there. It's an honest utopia. I mean, the thing is, part of where this comes from, I mean, there's all sorts of threads that led into writing this book. One of the threads that led into it, um, you know, on a bad day, I used to think, you know, wouldn't it be just great if civilization would just go away? You know, that would be just awesome. We wouldn't have to deal with this anymore. And just be, that'd be so cool. And I'd imagine, well, it could be like this, and it could be like that, and this would be happening, and this would be a, well, there's only one way that civilization could turn off with a, like a light switch like that, and that would be 90% of the people die. And, uh, of course, you know, when you're daydreaming, it's like, oh, this, you know, there'll all be people I don't like. It'll be okay. Um, and then I was sitting in a discussion group at grad school, and a friend of mine came into the group, and he was having a really bad day. I don't know why. And he decided to take it out on us and just get really grumpy. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what his deal was. But one of the things that he said... We were all having this happy conversation about how we can, you know, do community-based conservation. And his whole point was that, you know, human beings are just awful. And I don't believe that. He was having a bad day. But in the course of his being grumpy, he said, there are days when if I had a button, he, fold, he had a napkin, he folded up this napkin into a little button-sized napkin. He said, there are days when if I had a button that I could press, and would just make all humans die, including my daughter. And he loves his daughter. Like, he just, I'd press it. And I thought, wow. He's having the same daydream that I have on my bad days. And he's being honest about it. He's including himself, and he's including his daughter. And so I thought, you know, I mean, I can daydream about whatever I want. It's not going to make anything come true, you know, and that's fine. But it sort of seems morally bad to daydream about, you know, it's just wrong. Um, so I thought if it actually happened, if civilization just went away, went out like a light, and you know, billions of people died, and a small number of people survived, and they put together this new and glorious and beautiful world after this happens, what would that actually be like to live through? And the, you know, this book is, is my answer. You know, the, the, these characters are living in what's not a perfect world, but it's, it's a good world. And they're coping with trauma. You know, Andy doesn't know what happened to his son. His wife and daughter died. Elsie doesn't know where she spent her childhood, and she feels profoundly dislocated because of that. And she lost her family. You know, so this is kind of, it's my honest utopia. And I, do, I don't think that that's what has to happen in order to get there. You know, I think that we can have that better world where the question about is the planet going to die has been definitively answered no. I think we can get there without catastrophe. It's getting really dicey, but I think we can. Um, but, you know, this, this, is, this is the honest version of my daydream, is what that is. This is great. I want you to have time to sell your books. Thank you. Sign books. And thank you, everyone, for coming.
And Caroline, thank you so much. Fascinating. Fascinating. I had to put my mask on because I had a little post-traumatic stress there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so please, if you'd like to come on up and, and get a book, I would like to have one of each for the library. So let me go do that. Um, what is the prices on there? 17 each. Okay. And do read it. And when you're done, go on Amazon and do a good review or an honest review about her honest utopian and spread the word because I think this is really fascinating. And I can't even believe you came up with this before the whole thing.